afternoon, everyone. I'm Commerce Next co-founder Veronica Sonseb. And for those of you that are new, Commerce Next is a community event series and conference for marketers at retail and direct-to-consumer brands. On behalf of my fellow co-founders, Scott Silverman and Alan Dick, I want to welcome you to our weekly webinar series. Our topic for today is improving e-commerce and owning the customer journey. Given the growth of e-commerce over the last year, we wanna make sure that we're delivering the best possible experience and keeping customers shopping on our brand.com site whenever possible. So we're thrilled to bring you this webinar. We've partnered with Lee Zucker from Yex and he's gonna kick things off with a presentation on the new customer journey shaped by COVID-19. And then of course, we'll have our panel discussion where we'll dive deep into the topic. Now, I wanna run through some slides first for some thank yous um, and some housekeeping items. So first, I wanna thank our speakers, Nick Antonides, Vice President CRM and Analytics at Ashley Stewart, Vivian Chang, VP of Growth at Clorox D2C, Stacey Eddy, Director of E-Commerce at Keen Footwear, Lee Zucker, Head of CPG and D2C Industries at Yext. We are very grateful. We know how much time it takes and how busy you are. So we're grateful to have you participate. And all of today's speakers will receive gifts from our gifting partner, Gift Now, who's been a great to work with throughout this last year. I also wanna thank the audience for tuning in live. Five of the live viewers will be randomly chosen to receive gifts via Gift Now. Sorry for those who are watching the replay. And then finally, I want to thank Yaxt. It has been a pleasure partnering with Yaxt on this webinar. You'll see from the presentation, they have a wealth of information and we're really excited to be able to bring it to the audience today. So our agenda for today is quite simple. I'm going to start with going through some housekeeping items um, and upcoming events, and then, I'll, and then Lee will go through the new customer journey. Then we'll go back to you. We have some audience polls and then an audience, um, and then we'll have our panel Q&A and, um, sorry, our panel discussion with audience Q&A. So next week's webinar is on Wednesday, March 10th. It's marketing attribution in support of a full funnel strategy. We actually covered this topic during our marketing summit series, but it really merited going deeper. It was a popular topic. And we're excited to have Kelly Stringham, VP of e-commerce analytics and strategy at Cost Plus World Market, Jeff Sanders, CMO at First Leaf, Human Akavan, CMO at Carparts, and it's moderated by our very own Alan Dick, um, if you're interested in joining us, you can register at bit.ly slash cnweb30. I also wanted to remind all of you that Commerce Next has a YouTube channel. So if you missed any past events, our YouTube channel has a wealth of information. It's a great place to kind of catch up on some of the content that we've been producing. It's at youtube.com slash commerce next. Now, I'm gonna quickly go through housekeeping for those that are new and haven't joined us before. Don't worry if you miss anything. Um, we are recording this. The recording will be available tomorrow. So I'm just gonna show you where things are on the screen and then we'll get started. So we do have chat and we really encourage you to use chat to engage with the speakers and audience. We just ask that you don't be disrespectful or self-promotional. But if you have a question, we really want you to use the Q&A to ask questions. So the Q&A is a separate tab in, on the right-hand panel, and you just ask the question on the bottom. The nice thing about the Q&A is that it lets you upvote questions. So if another person in the audience sees a question that's already been asked and thinks it's important, they can upvote that question, and that helps us prioritize the questions that we ask our panelists. All of the handouts from today's webinar, which is the presentation that Lee's going to give, as well as a white paper that um, they shared, is available in the handouts. And for anyone who is watching the replay, those handouts can be found in the bottom of the player. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Lee Zucker. He's the head of CPG and D2C Industries at Yext. He's going to be talking about the new customer journey shaped by COVID-19. Right. Thanks so much, Veronica, and to the Commerce Next team. Uh, it's been a pleasure partnering with you and to the audience. I'm excited to be joining you uh, this afternoon. 
Um, so we have, of course, witnessed a, a crazy uh, year. It's been uh, almost a, a full year of this global pandemic. Um, but I think what's really interesting, what I'm excited to talk about, is how that has impacted our businesses um, over, the, um, over the last year, as well as moving forward. As Veronica mentioned, I'm Lee Zucker. I'm the head of industry for CPG D2C and manufacturing. And what that means is I run global product and strategy uh, related to these verticals. And I'm going to walk you through what I've been seeing in the industry via slides, as well as some live examples. But there are really three key trends that I've identified have really impacted the world of e-commerce and digital retail, as well as within our manufacturing CPG and D2C verticals. One is that the customer journey is really becoming more of a conversation. Two, that digital transformation has exploded. And three, that conversational experiences will change the technology stack forever. So with this first one, with the customer journey is a conversation, we as consumers um, and our customers are being trained to ask and interact with search platforms and our devices different than we ever have before. When, like five or 10 years ago, we used to ask questions or give Google really short keywords and statements and get back 10 blue links back on a screen. But now I could search for a really long tail query like what cleaning products are safe for kids and will kill coronavirus? And Google understands my query and is able to give me back direct answers in the form of FAQ. And obviously that is really relatable if you are part of a brand that provides cleaning supplies that might kill coronavirus, but let's take another example here where I might be searching for uh, Bluetooth speakers from Sony. And when I start that search on Google, I'm being brought or I'm being given reviews and different videos and different blogs that tell me about Sony's Bluetooth speakers, even though I'm asking that branded query. Then let's just say I have another question, what is needed to power an outdoor speaker system? I'm then given more different results. And then I'm asking multi-speaker outdoor system with Bluetooth, and you could see that list goes on. But what's different about the world today, especially within the world of search, is that this customer journey is no longer linear because of the experience that all of our different devices and search platforms are providing us, especially as the consumer is searching online more than ever before. And so what we see is that 73% of shoppers are using multiple channels during their shopping journey before they ultimately make that purchase, which is super challenging for a brand that has commerce on their own site. What we did is we did a study a few months back that surveyed a bunch of marketers, um, across the CPG and D2C world. And what we find, found is that consumers actually prefer to use a brand's own website. 43% of the CMOs that were surveyed said that, um, that their website is the most used channel for customers doing research. But that's really backwards when we actually look at this e-marketer stat that shows that 61% of U.S. adults begin their product search when they're looking to purchase that product on a marketplace like Amazon or a Walmart.com or a Target.com, even though these consumers prefer to use a brand's own website. Why is that happening, though? Why are consumers using those platforms to end up making purchases? Yes, there's a million reasons in terms of one-click purchases and the two-day shipping and, and all of that. But ultimately, that search experience, especially on Google, is so good at giving that consumer the question or the end result of what they're looking for. And when we think about a Google-like experience as a brand, we look at this type of query like best sneaker store near me open now that does curbside pickup. I'm like, wow, that's actually a really complex question to answer on my website via any sort of search experience. If we just break this apart by the different components, 
best is all based on reviews. Sneaker store is based on a primary category. Near me is geographically based. Open now is based upon hours of operation. And then curbside pickup is an additional service um, or additional attribute about a service at a specific location. And answering questions like this is super complex, but Google and Amazon and other search platforms are really good at doing that. And that is what's creating the conversation with these search platforms. Now, the second trend that we're seeing is that digital transformation exploded during this time. Um, and of course, with consumers being forced to shop online, we've seen the crazy stories of any of the digital grocers to the direct-to-consumer brands that are seeing that growth. But I think one of the most amazing stats that I read recently is that retail e-commerce sales in China hit over 50% for the first time this year and is expected to continue to grow over the next five years. And what we see is that e-commerce is going to continue to increase globally with the U.S. projected to see 15% of sales come from e-commerce in 2021 and then over 16% in 2022 with the, with the trajectory continuing to scale. And what's happening is we see retailers and brands that have never delved into e-commerce before starting to stand up direct to consumer experiences. General Mills is an amazing example where they've seen e-commerce business climb from 5% of total sales uh, 18 months ago to 10% last quarter. And what they're doing is they're starting to give consumers more of a reason to go to their website so that they can purchase on there. And they're doing so by creating recipes and better search experience so that their target audience can use their site to incentivize them to make the purchase on their site rather than using that marketplace. L'Oreal is now seeing about 20% of their revenue come from their own website. And a brand like Clorox, this is actually really interesting, and I'm excited for Vivian to be on the, on the call as well, talking about this a little bit later, but they're standing up their direct-to-consumer strategy, not just from a sales perspective and to increase those direct-to-consumer sales, but they recognize that the better data they get into their own D2C platform, the better that feedback loop is in terms of understanding how consumers are searching, what they want, what type of products they want, which would therefore uh, help with future marketing campaigns as well as brand innovation. And so what we're seeing is worlds really collide with this boom in e-commerce and digital transformation where we have traditional retailers that were relying on brick and mortar and manufacturers and CPG brands that were relying on those retailers for brick and mortar to really start converging on a space that has been growing over the last decade, which is direct to consumer, which has some really critical elements of e-commerce, sometimes retailers and dealers, their own support, and so then some sort of CRM and loyalty. And so with these worlds colliding, there's more competition across all of these realms in addition to the marketplaces that are becoming more critical to own that customer journey and provide that experience, that omni-channel experience that consumers want and expect. So the third trend is that conversational experiences will change the technology stack. Hopefully you've seen that through this presentation that conversational experiences exist with all of us starting our searches in Google and on these marketplaces, um, they're there and they're being used um, very actively, as well as this digital boom is creating that. What's interesting is with this convergence around direct-to-consumer retail and that tech stack is that technology, ad uh, technology adoption um, needs to shift to align to the new reality, including understanding product inventory in retail locations, service information, what services are you offering in different retail locations or delivery options. The website UI needs to change in order to drive consumers further down that funnel. And then e-commerce needs to become more sophisticated with personalization or just understanding what that search query ends up meaning. And all of these different experiences must be searchable, not 
only the e-commerce experience, the product experience where someone transacts, but everything around where can I buy, when can I buy, what can I buy where, as well as different services offered out at those retail locations. And who does this best other than Google? Well, I'm gonna give you a sneak peek into how Google does this and what is really critical for the future of our brands um, to, to do in order to compete. What Google does and what they shifted to in 2012 is a different type of database to understand all of the context of queries and also everything that they know about really the, the world when you search for something and get back either a map pack or a knowledge card or FAQ. And they've started structuring their data in this concept called a knowledge graph, which is essentially a brain-like database that has all the information that they know about the world. Now, the, with the knowledge graph, they're able to provide back these direct answers, which is what keeps us as consumers going back to them. So if I were to search for something like how tall is Mount Kilimanjaro, you can see that I get back a knowledge card as well as a featured snippet that gives me back a direct answer. They also have FAQ there, and then they have the organic blue links that we're used to from search a decade ago. Now, let's look at another example. Um, where they're using different types of algorithms in order to provide back direct answers. How do you restart your iPhone 11? Well, they're actually using a featured snippet algorithm to pull from Apple's website and provide back that zero base click search to show you exactly how to do that. They also have FAQs and organic links on the example on the, on the left. And on the right, they're using the knowledge graph to provide back direct answers in terms of locations when I'm looking for coffee near Times Square, as well as the organic links below that. So what Google has done is done a really good job structuring all of their data about everything that they know about the world to provide back direct answers to natural language questions. What we believe is the future in this world of e-commerce and this digital first world, especially within this segment of CPG, D2C, and manufacturing, is that every brand has their own knowledge graph that holds information about the products, where those products are located, what the return policies are, how you get it delivered, what careers you're offering at warehouses or retail locations nearby. The list goes on and on, and the ability to answer those natural language questions allows a brand to compete with sites like Google and Amazon and other marketplaces. So what we see is that the knowledge graph with all of the core information about your brand is going to be critical to a brand's website, to a brand's personalization and predictive analytics strategy, to content creation and commerce and voice as well as chat and search. Because in all of these different situations, you have information about where those products are being sold. What are the details and the specs and the price of those products? And across all these experiences, it's critical that that omni-channel experience for the end consumer is consistent and, and that all that information is structured in the way to be conversational for them. So with the little bit of time I have left, I wanna show you how the knowledge graph actually works in real life. And I'm gonna give you a couple retail and e-commerce examples to show you where, um, where you could see this real with natural language search. So I'm gonna use Bed Bath & Beyond and you could see you know, the, the search experience is training the consumer on how to actually search here, but I'm gonna search for um, uh, what is your return policy? And you could search, you could see that I'm getting back direct answers around what is the actual return policy. But I could, I could also uh, look at like what is curbside pickup and get back that direct answer there. Now to switch an example, I'm gonna go to more of a traditional CPG experience where I could search for what are your tomato soups? And I'm getting back more of a product rich experience here that shows me all the tomato soup um, soup products that Campbell's offers. But what I'm actually going to do is change the intent of that search, and I'm going to type in recipes. And you can see that experience has changed instantly where the search experience, just like Google's does, fully understands the intent of the query and gives me back relevant recipes to that. And then I can go ahead and re-click on 
the different verticals just like I would on Google and filter it down just like any sort of product or e-commerce search category. I'm gonna use Cox Communications as another example where I'm gonna do uh, view internet plans. Obviously this is more of a basic search, but I wanna show you this unique experience that is very Google-like that Cox created, where they have a featured snippet up here where it's really easy for me to change my plan. I have products here that show me all the different products they offer about internet plans. I continue scrolling down here, I have FAQ, and then I have videos. All of this is really relevant to my ultimate search query. Now I'm gonna show you one more example. Actually, I'll show you two examples with the time, and I'm gonna um, search for something like, uh, let's do directions to Brooklyn location. And you can see that just like Google, in this example, I'm given a map pack here to get me directions into that Brooklyn location. But in the same search experience, I could search for machine washable shirts. I could do machine washable white shirts and it changes. And then if I wanna go more into products or I wanna uh, actually make a purchase in that for that product, I can go to that product tab and you could see that there's more of an e-commerce search experience and I could change this to black and it's fully understanding the intent of the query, giving me a really easy checkout experience. One last one is the World Health Organization and I could search for how many coronavirus cases are in the US. And you can see what I'm getting back here is a direct answer that shows an ungodly number of coronavirus cases in the US, but this is an example comparable to Google's featured snippet here that gives me back that direct answer. So what Yex does is works with the most prominent brands in the world across regulated and unregulated industries, and of course, manufacturing, CPG, and retail to build knowledge graphs for these brands and ultimately optimize their search experience, keeping customers on a brand site and converting them quicker down the funnel. So with that, I'm excited um, to hand over the mic back to Veronica and we'll go ahead and have a really insightful conversation about this topic. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me on my email or on LinkedIn. Awesome, thank you so much, Lee, that was really great. Um, we're gonna do a couple of audience polls and then we're gonna go into the panel because we always like to hear, kind of take your temperature and, and get a sense of what you're thinking. So to kick things off on the poll side, um, oh, before we actually go to the polls, I want to remind you that the answers are under polls closed. Um, and for those watching the replay, it's in the bottom of the player. But here is our first poll. Customer journeys have changed during the pandemic. That is pretty obvious. But once things go back to normal, do you think customer journeys will return to what they were before? And you have three options here. And no, they're forever changed. Somewhat. I mean, some aspects will go back to normal. Some aspects will I mean, will stay as they are now, or yes, they'll go back to the way they were before, kind of at pre-pandemic levels. It's almost a split. 57% say no, um, they are forever changed. And 43% say that it'll somewhat go back to what it was, but literally nobody believes that things will go back to the way they were, which is so interesting. Um, our next question is, what aspect of the e-commerce experience is most important for keeping people on the site and preventing them from bouncing? Now, we know all of these are important, but we're going to ask you to pick one. Um, Product-related content, easy search and navigation, lifestyle slash inspirational content, streamlined checkout experience, or something else. And if you have something else, you can put your ideas in the chat. Well, the overwhelming majority of you think it's easy search and navigation. I think that's because Lee gave a very compelling presentation. But then the second um, is product-related content, then um, which is 15%, and then lifestyle inspirational content is 5%, and streamlined checkout is 5%. So um, on to the next question. When you're researching for a product to buy, where do you search? And, and really, in this case, you can select all that apply. Do you search on Amazon, Google, your, the brand.com site, another retail.com site, or do you look for third-party reviews? The majority search on Google, which is interesting, um, then 38%, then Amazon, and then the brand.com site. 
um, and a few people search on, third, on the re other retail sites and on reviews. And our last question, which I think you guys may have already seen, but what's your primary attribution KPI? And this is you know, a shout out to the webinar next week um, that will go deeper into attribution, but your options are return on ad spend, customer acquisition costs, customer acquisition costs um, as a ratio to customer lifetime value, um, the same customer acquisition costs as a ratio to customer lifetime value, but based on margin, um, incrementality or something else. And if it's something else, put it in the chat. It looks like the most common attribution KPI for this group is return on ad spend at 48%. The second most popular is the customer acquisition cost over lifetime value. Um, a few of you are just looking at CAC straight, and then a few are looking at it based on margin. And we have incrementality at 12%. So um, that's also something that you're looking at. And I guess with incrementality, you can look at it in combination with some of these other metrics. So um, thank you so much for taking that poll. Um, so now I'm excited to actually bring up our panelists. And we're going to have... Um, a discussion about how to actually improve e-commerce and own the customer journey. So thank you all for joining. Hi, Veronica. Hi. So <laughs> Stacey, Vivian, Nick, um, we you guys are new to the stage. So why don't you quickly just introduce yourselves? I'm gonna say we start with Stacy and then go to Vivian and Nick. If you want to introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Vivian and team. Um, I've been in the outdoor industry for over 20 years, and for the past 15 years, I've been with Keen Footwear. Um, in 2009, uh, there were four of us. We launched a, a brand website um, and quickly rolled out uh, Canada, Europe, and Japan. In 2015, we migrated over to SFCC, um, and I've pretty much been responsible for about every function within the e-commerce a uh, space for Keen, but I'm currently the senior director in e-commerce operations. Awesome, Stacy. We're thrilled to have you. Vivian? Hey, everyone. Happy to be here and happy to discuss this topic. Uh, like Lee previewed already a little bit before, uh, I am part of the direct-to-consumer group within the Clorox company. So I lead all marketing functions, acquisition, retention, PR, brand creative, um, and our group is essentially tasked with launching and growing a portfolio of direct-to-consumer brands within a CPG company. And so we've started first with some native pure play D2C brands in the wellness space and are actively now working across the entire brand portfolio to help D2C take a, a larger percentage of a role, uh, whether it's sales or first party data contribution. Awesome. And last but not least, Nick. Hi, great to be here. Um, I'm Nick Antoniadis. I'm the VP of CRM and Analytics at Ashley Stewart. And I've been in retail for quite a while in a lot of senior roles at uh, companies like Pepas and Beyond, uh, Vitamin Shop and, and others. And although Ashley Stewart doesn't talk publicly about its, its specific strategies, I am hoping to share a lot of uh, my experience across so many retailers in this particular topic. Awesome. Well, we're thrilled to have you today. I think this is an exciting topic. Um, I want to start off with, you know, what changes you've seen in terms of the customer journey. I, you know, we saw from the audience poll that most people believe that the journey is permanently changed, whether it's like exactly as it is now or whether it somewhat goes back to what it was. It's never going to go back to pre-pandemic levels, um, or at least that's what the majority of this webinar audience believes. So I guess um, maybe I'll start with you, Nick. You know, what changes have you seen um, in terms of customer journeys since the pandemic? Yeah, one of the prevalent trends that I've noticed across across actually uh, several retail sectors is in fact a higher frequency of sessions per visitor. So people actually visit sites a lot more than before, which opens up um, opportunities for the advanced navigation for improved search, for content, and so on, things that Lee has already touched on before and came up actually on your on your polls. Awesome. Stacy, anything you want to add to that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> to piggyback off the sessions piece, I would say that 
uh, fan contact. So at Keen, we call our customers fans. And we're seeing that people are calling in to uh, the fan service team just to talk. So touch points have increased um, as well as talk time. So we've ramped up our service team in response to that. And we've brought in a third assist in a basic product question in chat and email uh, and increased service hours in seven days a week. Awesome. So you actually, that was my follow up question is what have you done to adapt your e-commerce experience? And, you, and you've jumped right in, which is it kind of increased the customer service. And, and that makes a lot of sense because if people aren't going in store and they're not able to ask a sales associate some of the questions they would normally ask about the product, they're going much more to the brand um, to, to ask that. And actually, um, we had a question later, but Lee, I'm going to turn to you just really quickly because, I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of... Um, increased customer service calls. And I'm curious if you have any anything to add in terms of how brands are solving for that. Yeah, it's interesting. So we, we've we had a, a few partners of ours that have seen that that increase in calls. And there's some that, you know, there, there's the good calls that are like helping promote sales and, and create, you know, conversion. And then there's the calls that are just expensive because they take up talk time and it's just someone doing research. Um, and what we've seen is some brands partner with Yext to create a search experience that has actually ended up mitigating some of those unwarranted support calls by between 40 and 45%. So people asking like, how do I check my gift card balance? Um, or what are your return policies? Things like that. Um, so we've seen crazy escalations with some of our partners. And we've seen based on also what the poll is saying that search and navigation has really um, helped offset that um, quite a bit. And that makes a lot of sense. If you can answer your own questions, then you don't need to call customer support. So um, great advice. Now, Nick, I want to turn to you because, you know, Ashley Stewart has stores, but also a lot of the other companies you work with have physical presences. You know, with having a physical presence, how has that been impacted um, from a customer journey standpoint? So there is obviously the, the, the clear change where people don't go to the stores, but it has opened up opportunities for retailers some are obvious, Bopus, curbside pickup, those are interesting ways to help the customer journey. But stores have also evolved, uh, or there are efforts to evolve them into exploration hubs or centers for the brand to promote the brand and for people to actually learn more about the brand, not just the physical place that you go and buy something. Yeah. Are you still? Okay, perfect. Yeah. I want to make sure that I didn't lose the sound. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that we've seen in like in the news and our research is like this e explosion of BOPIS, um, although definitely in curbside, um, although definitely like at the peak pandemic levels, it was highest, it pulled back a little bit, but it's something that's obviously been very popular and people are continuing to use it. Um, now, if we, if we kind of take a step back and look at our e-commerce site, and you know that is the the hub. That's where our consumers, I want to say, go first. But it's our first direct experience with them. What are the metrics you look at um, from uh, to evaluate the performance of your e-commerce site? And Vivian, I'll I'll start with you on this question. Yeah, um, I mean, I think there's probably a, a share a lot of shared metrics with what the audience is measuring, like a lot of the basic stuff. What are our traffic levels and engagement bounce rate. And then you start moving down the funnel, how many people are looking at product detail pages and adding products to cart and ultimately conversion rates. Um, and then you also then focus on the health of consumers, right? What is our repeat purchase rate? Uh, whether it's from a newly acquired customer or someone who has been part of the brand family for a long time. Um, and I think part of what adds to the story besides the KPIs and the metrics um, are things like we look a lot at heat mapping. So where are people getting stuck? Where are the points of entry? How is that different between desktop and mobile and things like qualitative survey? So it really is this triangulation from a lot of different areas to try and deeply understand the consumer experience. And heat mapping is a great way to kind of, you can see the ultimate metrics, but heat map mapping is a great way to understand exactly where they got stuck. Um, Nick, is it anything else that, that 
you're looking at from a website metrics perspective? Um, I think Vivian was very thorough. I think the, <laughs> check, <laughs> the checkout funnel tends to be very important, obviously, to know where you're losing them both. Um, reactivation rates or repeat activity, also crucial elements of that. Um, you've got marketing channel performance, obviously, that everybody tracks to make sure all the channels are, are aligning properly and are delivering on their goals. Um, and then, of course, how do people actually find products? How many people search versus how many people navigate? The, uh, what Vivian said on the heat mapping, but how effective are the different promos around the, the particular page? How deep down do you go on a PLP? So all those are elements that tell you a lot about how the journey is changing and, and what is crucial for people to understand. Yeah. I'll also jump in really quick because the other uh, key metric that we that I keep a pulse on is site speed. Because as we're building out um, you know, enhanced product detail pages and we're, we're adding uh, richer content to the site and we have an increase in, in sessions and traffic to the site, um, it's important to to keep track of of how you know the back end and the site is is responding to that. Absolutely, and and site speed is obviously something that has a direct impact on conversion as well. So definitely an important upstream metric. Um, I'm going to feed in a few audience questions that are kind of re related to what we're talking about here. Alex Baker had a question, and Lee, this one is for you. Um, he asked if there's research about why Google decided to switch to the knowledge graph-based search results, anything beyond kind of personalization or omni-channel. Um, is there anything about it being better? Yeah, so the the knowledge graph, um, I mean, you can, you can look at the metrics of Google's just search capacity and how many searches they get, you know, per minute, per hour, per day, um, and just see like how that scaled over the last you know decade. When you think about um, 10 years ago, uh, yeah, 10 plus years ago, before they had a knowledge graph, think about what search was like. When you search for anything, if you search for a long, you know, long query, you weren't getting anything back. But usually you would search for like burgers and a zip code or restaurant and a zip code. And then like old school SEO was all about, let's just get to like the top few, uh, top few links on that page. Um, but now you could search for anything and get back that, that direct answer. Um, so it's really um, less of a either or, it's more of a, uh, an evolution of what that search experience has become in order to keep you know, people on on Google and giving them back direct answers. But what a knowledge graph is, it's just a different way of managing data that's based upon relationships between entities or categories. So think about like products available at specific locations or products that are of a certain spec or color, like the washable white shirt examples that were given or that query that I gave like best sneaker store near me, et cetera. That's all based upon different data points of a knowledge graph being related together in order to answer that query. So I think Google's success is the, is the metric that shows the value of the knowledge graph, but it's really the output and that search experience which showcases why it's so valuable. Yeah, and, and even if you kind of go back to our audience poll, at least the folks that are watching this webinar, the majority of them start at Google when they're looking for something. So that alone just tells you that they're getting the answers they need, right? So yeah, exactly. um, it's, it's, been a, it's, it's definitely been advancing from that perspective. So um, we're focusing on, on the whole brand.com experience, but I would be remiss to kind of only talk about the e-commerce experience without kind of putting it in the perspective of third-party retail sites or marketplaces. So how, you know, Stacey, I'm gonna start with you. How do you think of the third-party retail sites or marketplaces versus your own experience? Are they a necessary evil? Are they a partner? You wanna talk about that? Sure, uh, third-party marketplaces are definitely our partners. Um, one way that I like to look at it is that these third parties have much deeper pockets and marketing dollars than we would ever have. So with brand awareness being a really important metric for Keen, um, I think that that you know there are tactics that we can take that, that have our brand site stand out, uh, you know, as opposed to stand out from the third parties. But at the end of the day, they absolutely are our friend. 
And are you, like when we talked on the prep call, you mentioned, you know, sometimes consumers are researching and learning about the product on your brand.com site because it's a richer experience, but right. ultimately buying with the retailer site and you're cool with that. Absolutely. I mean, they're part of our long range plan and strategy um, and brand aware goes back to brand awareness. Right. So there, I mean, we, we can have, uh, you know, match pricing and we can have uh, specific products that we call SMUs that are built, you know, that are only launching on our site to keep people on our site when they come and navigate. Um, you know, and we can also differentiate ourselves by the, uh, exceeding the level of service that people are looking for. So there are tactics we can take to keep people on the site. But again, at the end of the day, um, a, a pair of jeans on feet is a pair of jeans on feet regardless of where they buy. Awesome. Um, and Vivian, you also sell both direct and through third party. Anything you want to add? How do you look at your retail and marketplace partners? Yeah, um, I mean, if you take a traditional CPG company, it used to be entirely through retail partners, whether in-store or retailer.com or an Amazon e-commerce experience. And it's only, you know, in the more recent years and hopefully growing through as we go into the future that direct-to-consumer and the ability to buy from its a CPG you know, site itself is even possible. And so... Absolutely, we have to maintain those relationships and also figure out how to differentiate for the consumer. During COVID times, and no surprise, we saw more of our revenue come in through Amazon. And we kind of just changed our view. I'd say Amazon of all of the partners is probably a little bit more of that frenemies, like you said, uh, in that it has such a large pull for consumers, offers convenience certainly, but you don't keep that consumer relationship. And during COVID times when, consume, when convenience and product availability is king, we were okay with that. But as we go kind of future state, our goal would, to, would be to have you know, lower percent of revenue from Amazon and to get that by offering more incentives and more benefits for a consumer to come to retailer.com, whether that is product innovation or maybe more sustainability on our shipping options with refills or subscription uh, or things like customer service, like uh, 365 day guarantees, like things that um, I think surround the package of what that e-commerce experience is and aligns with what consumers ultimately looking for. And that's a lot of the the conversations that we have actually, even within Clorox right now, of thinking about how do you build DTC experiences? It's not just about putting in the front end and the back end and the marketing channels to be able to stand up a site, but what is that specialness that we're offering that makes our brand more compelling to come to us? So to summarize, it seems like it's, it's more information about the products, subscription options, and now I'm trying to remember the third option, the third thing that you mentioned Product innovation certainly is a big one. Customer service, uh, there's Customers. a lot in there. I mean, pricing obviously is one that is a lever that we have to use carefully, um, mm -hmm. but that's something that um, we might do at certain pulse, pulse periods, for example, too. And when you say product innovation, are you differentiating the products that you have available on your own e-commerce sites versus what you have in retailers and marketplaces? Not in every case, uh, but the goal is to have some exclusive selection that are only available through the site or ultimate personalization. A great example is for its fees. You can get a personalized lip balm that actually has your name on it. That's only going to be available if you come to us directly, right? And that's a great gift product. So things that make it a little bit more special, uh, we'd like to, to keep and protect on our brand.com experience. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And Stacy, can you talk about what, what you're doing also to kind of differentiate your brand.com experience? Um, I would go back to, uh, you know, what Vivian's talking about with regards to product in innovation and bringing to market products that you can only find on teamfootwear.com. Um, also, uh, 
price matching is one lever that we did pull quite often um, last year, and which we're pulling back and doing less promotional activities this year. Um, but really, at the end of the day, um, the exceeding fans' expectations in service is really where we're going to be able to, to have the biggest win. Yeah. And that, and ultimately, like, it's that service that is what wins that customer for the long term, like making it easy for them to buy and then servicing them well. Um, that's awesome. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about digital stickiness, and I'm going to bring Lee into this conversation. You know, how do you create that digital stickiness on the e-commerce site? Obviously, you know, there's a there's a partnership with the retailers, but but brands want that ex the customer to stay on their site as much as possible. What can they do? Yeah, I, I think like it was very telling with the poll that you um, that you shared of like where do where does the audience start their search experience or where do they you know um, begin their journey? And while it was select all that apply, the majority said Google first. Um, right. So why is Google so sticky um, and why do you always start there? Well, it's because Google always has has that answer. Well, in the world where um, less consumers are going into brick and mortar retail than ever before, if I'm walking into my local Walgreens looking to buy cleaning solution and, you know, Clorox is, is there, I can go ahead and buy it. But competitor direct to consumer brand that's outside of the Clorox portfolio is not. I'm buying what's within, you know, Vivian's brand's, you know, portfolio. Um, that being said, when I'm on a digital experience and I'm within a Clorox site or a Keen site or an Ashley Stewart brand site, um, and I can't get the answer that I'm looking for, it's so easy for me to leave and go out into the ocean of competitors and ads that live on Google and um, and Amazon. So the recommendation to create that Google stickiness is look at them as the, the leaders and the ones that are pioneering that customer experience and try and build search experiences, navigational experience, personalization experiences, incentivized content and brand in order to keep people there, but they need to be able to find it. They need to be able to find the recipes and the product makeup and what, you know, is the value of those unique products. So I think, again, back to the poll, the, the navigation and search components are so critical to do that. And it's all about lack of bounce, more sessions on site, more time on site, which are the, are the key indicators of that stickiness. Awesome. Um, and Laura in the audience had a question that was related to this. So I'm going to um, follow up with her question, which is, you know, how can you best measure the secret ingredient? I guess if whether it's experience or the product or is it service, how do you know what is kind of creating that um, KPI of keeping people on the site? How do you tell between all of those pillars that you're putting in place? I don't know. Anyone want to volunteer to answer that question? Do you measure um, the <laughs> it's a bit of a non-answer is what jumps out in my mind first. Like, I don't know that we really try to parse it out that specifically. Um, you know, they all feed into each other. If we think of ourselves as everyday consumers that buy a product because I like the brand ethos and the experience and all of those things. Um, and so I think product level maybe is closest to actual KPIs that you measure and maybe brand is more through NPS or qualitative surveys. I think that's kind of how I think about it at least. Any, any one want to add to that? Um, it is really like a three-legged stool, though. It is, it's the product, it's the website experience, and it's the customer service they get. And I guess if you get lots of returns, that's one way to kind of see that there's an issue with the product. Um, awesome. I guess my, my one comment on that, Veronica, is I'd say like while, while there's like all of these different components, um, and I, I feel like we speak about this as, as marketers constantly, is like more data is great, but how you use that and how you create the feedback loop is the most critical thing. So once you get a nugget that that makes sense about a product or you know a campaign that you ran or an experience that you changed, if things are looking good, how do you do more of it? If things are looking bad, how do you not do more of it? And who are the teams that are involved and where are you getting the data, the content, the you know, the servicing to to make that happen? So I think that's 
the most critical point is data is great, but how you use it is the most critical. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I guess to your point on data, I want to kind of double click on that because content is still something that is very important. Um, I mean, ultimately, that's what they're searching. So maybe Vivian, I'll start with you. How does content play into the e-commerce experience at Clorox? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's absolutely woven into everything. I think if you think about, and Lee shared this earlier, the consumer journey is no longer linear. It's not even close, right? It used to be maybe the website was your front door and you could guide consumers through a certain way. Now it's, you know, I don't know if we even have doors. It's like you could, someone could be introduced to the brand through an influencer on TikTok, or it could be an Instagram shopping ad or a podcast audio spot. And so I think the content being woven intimately with the e-commerce experience and understanding from a brand that it doesn't necessarily even live on our owned and operated sites and properties anymore and making sure as a team internally that we're thinking through that whole narrative and the storytelling through all of it to create that compelling experience for a user. And I think also increasingly seeing that greater surround sound in terms of multiple touch points and more frequency uh, helps with creating that loyalty, getting to that first product trial. I think consumers want to know, it's not just the product, but a little bit more about the brand and that you know others like them also like it through reviews. And so, you know, the marketer job I think is is getting more challenging, uh, but it's also a really kind of fun and dynamic time. And so content is a big piece of how how we think about everything on the e-commerce piece. Nick, is there anything you want to add to that, at least from like an email perspective? Because obviously there's the content they see on the site and then there's the content yeah. they get in email. Actually, in fact, and, and Vivian touched on that quite well, is that content is actually expanding well beyond the confines of your own website and your own marketing channels. It's actually becoming almost like a, a halo surrounding all the, all the effectiveness that you have on your website. And it's propagating itself through articles that people find influences, as Vivian mentioned. You have uh, content sites that actually create their own content now and talking about your brand without your input, at least not your direct input. So content is becoming so much more prevalent and more central to how you need to think not just about your e-com side, but about your brand overall. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's really helpful. Um, there is an audience question here that I want to get to because I think it's really relevant to our conversation, which is who owns the customer journey in your respective orgs? Is it marketing, e-commerce, merchandising, the CEO? Tough question. Stacey, do you want to start? You're nodding, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I would say that the e-commerce team as a whole owns the uh, customer journey. Um, and it really begins with the uh, planning and product and the broadcast calendar. So the merchandisers own that piece. How is it with your company, Vivian? Who owns the customer journey? Uh, it depends. But I think what's interesting is you're starting to see within our CPG world, there's a there's an omni-channel team that really is responsible for making sure that the partners, the retailer.com, the shopper marketing teams are talking to the e-commerce team, talking to the sales teams, and you know, making sure that they're that we're even having that conversation. So I think it's a work in progress. Um, that we're honestly kind of still working towards, but it just ha starts with foundationally getting the right people in the room and at least having that conversation. Yeah, Vivian, we're like totally seeing that across CPG brands that we work with is there's someone there and it's, I've been, I've worked for tech companies my whole career and we have uh, chief customer officers in tech companies, but I'm actually seeing is like, this concept of chief customer officer who owns the customer journey of a B2B software company is now making its way across this segment because it's exactly what you said, someone who owns the full omni-channel um, experience. But in our world, we see a lot of the times it's, it's CMO or e-commerce. 
um, like Stacy mentioned, but uh, we see like the roles that Vivian mentioned become way more common too. It's it's funny. We had a whole session on marketing org at the marketing summit series in I think it was on February third, and one of the things that came out of it was like a great org is not. It's all about communication. A perfectly aligned org can still be dif be difficult. It can still be challenges if the communication is bad. But you can have an unideal org, but really good communication where people are in regular dialogue and all of the. Um, and all of the departments are talking to each other and it can be very functional. So that's like kind of what I'm hearing in, in Vivian and your response, Lee. Mm -hmm. Nick, anything to add? Uh, no, I think Vivian and Stacey really captured it very well. Awesome. I have one more question um, and it's from Bob Land at Doral and he wanted to ask, um, are the panelists also responsible for the post-purchase experience? If not, do they see that as a future of their customer journey responsibilities. And Stacy, I'm going to direct this to you because I know that that this is such a strong point at Keen. Absolutely. So uh, we are, I am responsible for um, the post purchase experience. And one of the places that we're um, really paying attention to is the out of box experience. There's each piece of that customer contact and that journey that we can enhance. And that is, you can find it as one that we absolutely can enhance. So um, uh, out-of-box experience and then warranty. We touched on it earlier um, uh, in our panelist review that he uh, processes all warranties on the website. So being able, regardless of which uh, the fan has purchased the product. So we're able to turn a maybe negative experience into a positive brand experience through our direct mail. Awesome. And that makes a lot of sense. And it's a really smart strategy to kind of get them to come in and register their product on their site. So even if they do buy on the marketplaces or the retailer sites, you can still have that direct customer relationship. Um, Vivian, Nick, do you does the customer service experience or custom post purchase experience fall under your groups? Vivian, you want to start? Yeah, um, it does because uh, we're ultimately responsible for driving revenue and you know for a successful D 2 C brand that repeat revenue and the look customer loyalty is a key part of that and so we are responsible for that post purchase and I think what I love about D 2 C is that all of those pieces have to be talking together, right? Customer service and what Stacy just said about that unboxing experience, all of those really are part of the brand. And I think that's innately what consumers are tapping into when they say they're gonna buy a product from a D2C brand. So we have to think about and to live up to all of those different areas. Yeah, and you've done some beautiful rebranding with your product packaging. Um, so it's kudos to you Thank for you. that. <laughs> Nick, anything you want to add to this? Uh, generally, it's just part of digital operations because it has to be. And in fact, it is integrated as part of the customer journey. How do you actually take them through the post purchase and then hopefully drive them back in again? So Stacy mentioned some of those ideas, but it is it is an integral part of the customer journey to begin with. Yeah. Awesome. And I've even heard some brands starting to use that CX experience to also upsell customers and like really get them to make that next purchase too. So there's a huge opportunity there. I think if, if it ends up kind of moving out of being a cost center and being part of the whole e-commerce experience as a whole. Um, well, I am so grateful to have you all participate today. It's been a pleasure having this conversation. I think we had a really rich discussion about what it takes to improve e-commerce, how to own the customer journey, and what that really means in the context of the whole retail um, and marketplace ecosystem. For those of you who are watching, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back next week with a, our webinar on attribution, and you're not going to want to miss that. So thanks so much, and have a great day. Thank, thank you. you.